A few weeks after the 2022 release of Todd Fields' film Tar, I was already hearing buzz about it from film nerds I respect. It instantly rocketed to the top of most of their best of the year lists. Its titular character, Lydia Tarr, achieved an almost instant mimetic status in film conversations. One cinephile I respect remarked that it had been a long time since a film had reminded him that movies can do that. I wasn't personally all that interested in seeing a two and a half hour drama about conducting orchestras, but the high praise was impossible not to notice and I found myself intrigued. Right at that same time though, junk food journalists were taking a different approach, eagerly trying to bait clicks by calling the film a meditation on cancel culture. Even though its writer-director Todd Fields and its lead actor Kate Blanchett were much more interested in talking about power, corruption, and the ambiguities that come from hierarchical, insular systems, many interviewers were very clearly trying to force juicy sound bites about hashtag me too and similar hot button issues guaranteed to stir up discourse. And while I wasn't too interested in settling in for a lengthy orchestra drama, I was pretty actively disinterested in seeing a movie about cancel culture made by people who I don't necessarily trust on that topic. The journalists trying to froth up controversy inadvertently put me off seeing the film entirely. But those wise, beautiful boys of the Flophouse podcast just wouldn't shut up about how good Tar was, and them I do trust. So I took the plunge. I'm going to now spoil Tar, but as someone who hates spoilers, I had the film spoiled for me initially, and it really didn't take away from my enjoyment. This is a film you just kind of inhabit. Knowing what will happen will not take you out of feeling what is happening. Take it from me. Anyway, the film is actually pretty simple. Lydia Tarr is a world-famous orchestra conductor at the top of her game. She is both a woman and a lesbian, potent combo, who broke through the male-dominated world of conducting on pure passion and talent. She is spoken of alongside recent greats like Leonard Bernstein, as well as rising stars like Hildur Goodnadotter. She has a book coming out, she's about to conduct Mahler's Fifth Symphony in what should be her magnum opus. Everything's coming up Tarr! One problem, though. Lydia Tarr likes to fuck. And unfortunately, she has a thing for younger women over whom she has immense power. And Lydia Tarr is not a woman who takes no for an answer. While we don't ever learn detailed specifics of her relationships and abuses, Lydia finds herself accused of using her status as a chief conductor and music industry power player to coerce sex and to blacklist women who reject her advances driving one of her former victims into self-harm. The film follows Lydia as her carefully curated, climate-controlled world crumbles. This is a film shot from the emotional point of view of a controlling perfectionist, a demanding artistic genius who finds herself out in the cold, inch by frosty inch, as she desperately, futilely clings to respect and authority. And it ends with one of the funniest punchlines I've ever seen in a character drama. The film took me a while to process. It's a long art house character study. Many of the big dramatic beats happen off screen, but it's never boring. Lydia Tarr is too fascinating for that. Kate Blanchett delivers a mesmerizing performance embodying this complex figure who's either damaged or hollow, but who wears control and prestige like dazzling armor. The film begins with her at her most dominant and then slowly unravels her until the audience and the character herself are forced to reckon with who exactly it is that's left. But I want to go back to those interviewers desperate to make this film about cancel culture. Because they were right, but perhaps not in the way that they wanted to be. See, Lydia Tarr is pretty impressed with herself, and so is everyone else. She has devoted her life to excellence in execution. She speaks multiple languages. She can wax eloquent about long dead composers. She's always the smartest person in the room, always in control, directing everyone else to follow her tempo, her rhythm, her interpretations. When the allegations about her predatory sexual behavior begin to blow up in her face, she's obviously upset, but to my eyes, it's not with shame at being caught or rage at being, in her mind, falsely accused. It's with indignation at being inconvenienced. For Lydia Tarr and her management team, 
The problem is that a genius was being distracted from her important work. We see this attitude all the time when an actor or a director is accused of abusing others, Joss Whedon, Johnny Depp, Roman Polanski, when a famous author reveals themselves to be disgustingly bigoted, Orson Scott Card, J.K. Rowling, Roald Dahl, or when musicians like Marilyn Manson, Michael Jackson, or R. Kelly are accused of despicable crimes. This is even the theme of one of the pivotal scenes in the film when Lydia berates a non-binary, non-white student for their antipathy towards Bach. She's incredulous that something as trivial as how Bach treated women could have any bearing on his legacy as one of the greatest composers of all time. There's a certain view of the world in which genius is rare and precious and that sometimes us lowly peasants will have to put up with the volatile behavior of geniuses in order to reap the rewards. There's this fear that genius is scarce, fleeting, and that if we fail to maximize the output of these singular individuals, we may lose out on world-changing contributions forever. A little abuse here, a little rape there. Would you really trade the sublime, century-spanning splendor of Picasso's art, or the highly influential music of Jimmy Page, Steven Tyler, or Tupac Shakur, just to protect some nobody in the margins of their lives? But the film Tar brilliantly lays bare the intellectual bankruptcy behind this worldview, and it does so in the very first scenes of the film. Actually, it does so before the first scene of the film. Tar begins with a long credit sequence, white text on a black screen, with audio of Lydia Tar directing a recording of a traditional song of the Shipibo Kinibo people indigenous to the country of Peru. The film then begins in earnest with Adam Gopnik interviewing Lydia for NPR, and interestingly, this interview is intercut with scenes of Lydia's preparation for this interview. We see her poring over vinyl record covers looking for outfit inspiration. We see a team of tailors crafting her outfit and stylists getting her put together. We even see her assistant mouthing Adam Gopnik's introduction of Lydia along with him, indicating that it was the assistant who wrote it. Even after these opening thematic salvos, again and again in the film, we see that Lydia Tarr is surrounded by people making things happen for her. Assistants doing the grunt work, sound guys making her recordings, financiers cutting the checks, management teams handling her publicity, drivers and pilots delivering her wherever she needs. Even her wife is shown to run much of the day-to-day -day in the Berlin Philharmonic, along with being the main caretaker of their daughter. This army of dull, genius-less labor frees up our sensational prodigy, Lydia Tarr, to tap a few notes on her piano, get some exercise done, groom her next would-be target. The film Tarr does address this anxiety that cancel culture might be chilling speech and depriving the world of its next genius by letting us in on a little secret. Genius, by itself, is nothing. It's not that rare, it's not that special, and it's not that useful without many, many other hands to do the work. Todd Field, the film's writer and director currently being celebrated as a genius auteur, makes that very clear by placing the entirety of the credits first. Without those hundreds of names, this film was just some words on a page. Sure, some people's brains work in unique ways that allow them to innovatively combine concepts or imagine possibilities, but by and large what most geniuses like Lydia Tarr actually have is the time and the money and the energy to monofocus on something until they're masters at it. What's rare is not genius, but access to the resources that allow genius to work. Like yeah, Bach wrote Air on the G-String around 1730, and it's a real banger, no argument here. But that's the same year that Sally Bassett, an enslaved woman in Bermuda, was burned at the stake for allegedly poisoning slavers. Had Sally Bassett not been abused and enslaved by English colonizers, what enduring works might she have been capable of? We know she practiced medicine late into her life. What kinds of medical genius was the world denied because of colonialism? Isaac Newton published the Principia Mathematica in 1687, arguably influencing the study of math and physics for centuries afterwards. That same year, three different battles broke out between the Holy League and the Ottoman Empire during the Great Turkish War, a war which overlapped with numerous skirmishes in Western Europe during the Nine Years' War. 
Across both conflicts, over one million soldiers were killed, to say nothing of the toll on civilians caught in the crossfire. How many geniuses vanished in the blink of an eye across all those battlefields? How much once-in-a-lifetime art and music rotted away alongside the piles of bodies across Europe? The dirty little secret that many so-called geniuses don't want you to know is that a lot of people could have produced something great if they'd been given the opportunity and hadn't been stuck working two jobs or struggling with medical debt or being exploited by parasitic landlords or being imprisoned or killed for the crime of being the wrong color in a white neighborhood. Cancel culture is not depriving the world of genius. Capitalist, racist, ableist exploitation is. A system that concentrates wealth by stomping down on a permanent underclass chews through human potential at an astronomical rate. We're not missing out on medical breakthroughs because doctors are getting in trouble for using slurs. We're missing out on them because pharmaceutical companies are holding our bodies hostage for profit. We're not missing out on life-changing movies, music, and games because directors and designers keep getting in trouble for sexual abuse, but rather it's because those fields are so exploitative that many people simply cannot afford, monetarily, physically, emotionally, to bring their visions to life. To put it another way, my life and my worldview have been radically influenced by YouTube video essays and some of the most powerful and innovative YouTubers I know are broke, disabled, and exhausted. We can't even conceive of the lives that might be changed if they had access to secure housing, abundant food, medical care, and sufficient rest. Has a content creator ever said something that changed your mind or changed your life? Aren't you curious about what other artistic keys could be out there just waiting to unlock new life inside you? So yes, the film Tar is something of a meditation on cancel culture, but rather than lament how accountability hamstrings the world's very important people, the film instead shows us that the very important people are actually the legion of often unnamed and often unthanked workers making life happen for all of us. The drivers, the servers, the note takers, the planners, the designers, the cleaners, the fetchers, the shelvers, the organizers, the gardeners, the caretakers, the doers. There's plenty of genius inside all of these people, it's just buried under 12 hour days, mounting debts, and simmering anxiety. What Tar shows us is that we should be worried less about protecting the powerful from repercussions and much more about liberating the powerless from precarity.